hands together. How are you guys doing? Nice. Well, thanks for joining. We've got a nice, you want to get a bit closer? I feel like if I, if I get too far, you yeah, come sit up on stage with me, it's not a problem. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess I'll start off at the beginning, which is kind of why I'm here, which is obviously I was invited here by the good people of uh, the campus party. And they said, you know, can you come down, talk to us a little bit about what, what, we, what we do? And in order for me to talk about what we do, I should probably go back a little bit and first talk about what I do. Um, I've been working in video games for about 10 years. Uh, worked for Activision, EA, some of the big big companies out there. Um, worked on a lot of different projects, pushed out about 30, 30 plus titles as a marketing manager, product manager, brand manager, different titles. Tony Hawk, a lot of fun there. Force Unleashed, one and two, great games. Um, Lego, Lego Indie, Lego Star Wars, that kind of stuff. So got a good bit of a, a, a background in how does publishing, how does somebody go about pushing out a product from there's a developer, there's a publisher, and there's an audience. And basically, publisher sits in the middle and says, I've got a game here, it's being made. I'm pretty sure if I put that game out just before Christmas, this audience right over here is gonna be eager to get involved. And that's the way it went for years. I mean, we're talking from the 80s, on the Nintendo 8-bit, all the way through to probably, I'd say, five, six, six years ago. That was just the model. Somebody just sat there and said, right, I've got a game, it's a new first-person shooter. Sounds awesome. I'm going to go to a publisher. Let's say THQ. They're not around anymore, so they don't get mad at me using their name. THQ says, right, that game looks cool. I'm pretty sure we can sell X amount of copies, and we'll put it out at this time for the audience. So in selling that game to the audience, they'd have to think to themselves, what realistically can we make back on that game? The game's a first-person shooter. We know a similar first-person shooter also set on a space planet that sold one million copies. So we're gonna say, can we get the same amount of number on this new game? Yeah, the install base of the Xbox has gone up a little bit, so there's probably a million one. That's what we think, the potential for this game, worldwide, one territory, however, you can break it down. That's what we think we can do. And they would create a pool of money for marketing to go into that one point in time when that game goes live. So let's say it was 1st of November. Game's gonna go live 1st of November. 1st of November, everything needs to kick off. MTV campaign to speak to the right audience members, banner advertising, maybe an event like this where they have the game playable as a demo, visit PAX, Gamescom, whatever, whatever event they're gonna use to push that game at that one moment. And everything had to hit that one moment for a simple reason that once that game hit the stores, after that time, the game had no value. You walk into a, a HMV, GameStop, whatever it is. I height, games across there, number one place. That's the most expensive spot for any game to be. And it'll live there at I height and your Tesco's or whatever for maybe two weeks, three weeks. They pay a lot a month. But then at a certain point, boom, it's down to crotch height. That means I've got to go down like this to see it. Less stuff, and there's a new game at the eye height. The next game's come out, so now you're down here. After that, you get turned on the sign and you become spine only. So now I've got to look with my head sideways to read the name, and I've got to flick through a whole bunch to get them. That's the cycle of a game in the classical trade way, which works the same online. When you go to Amazon, you'd have the same thing. You'd see in Amazon, what's the first thing that gets popped up, gets shown to you? Are you interested in buying this game? That's only going to happen when the game is being pushed and promoted, and there's money to be done, done there. So that's my background, pushing that process. What I'm going to talk about, just make sure I don't lose my place here, is kind of what is the, the next step in that. The next step can be seen quite easily in the sense that historically, games were done in this, in this fashion. And it's very similar to, let's say, what all brands have been doing since the, let's say, the 80s. I like Nike. What did Nike embed in my mind when I was a young boy? That if I wear Nike shoes, I'm an athlete. I'm Michael Jordan. I'm whoever I want to be because they were selling their brand to me. Coca-Cola. Everybody knows a commercial where there's some good-looking dude standing on a beach going, mmm, 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 this is awesome. And by that person drinking that, you're watching at home or in a magazine or in the movie theater or whatever, when you see Coca-Cola and you're like, ah, I want to be that dude. 
I want to be that girl, I want to be that guy, I want to be that astronaut, whatever, because they're selling you something. What's changing now is as of, I'd say, the dawn of our social media of creating a much smaller globe where I could, in theory, speak to all of you in one voice. If we all followed each other on Twitter right now, I could send a message as I leave the O2 today saying, I love you, and you'd all get it immediately. And you'd all be able to respond, that's new. So what, what that means is that we've changed the way that a company pushes a brand from me just talking at you and saying, hey, you just hear what I have to say and you choose, do I like it? Do I want to side with it? Oh, Rolex. I'd love to have a Rolex. Yeah, that means great status. So I'll, I'll buy the Rolex. That's changed now. Now the company wants you to do the work for them which makes sense because everybody now has a voice. Everybody now has an opinion that can be pushed out from the kind of the classic approach of marketing to now the, the, the ego marketing. So my voice is more powerful to an extent than Coca-Cola's. Our voices are way more powerful because if we all now turn around on that same Twitter account and all start saying, uh, you know, the O2 Arena had a bad smell today, if you each have 10, 20 people that you're speaking to, that's the explosion. I don't need to explain social media, most people understand that. I work for a company called Total Entertainment, and rather than me going into very detailed layers of what Total Entertainment does, I'm gonna play you guys a nice video here. If all goes well, yay. You're gonna have to bear with me because sadly I have to go via the interwebs, but we should. Yay. Esports is the sports of the digital generation. Amateurs and professionals compete in individual and team disciplines for fame, honor, and cash. Watched by millions, day by day, week by week, year by year. In 2000, Turtle Entertainment started a revolution. The Electronic Sports League, pioneering competitive gaming and creating a multi-million dollar business, evolving into an international group operating in over 45 countries with local offices in Germany, France, Spain, Poland, China, Brazil, and the United States, making them the only true global esports company and partner of choice for Intel, Blizzard, and Riot, paying over $10 million in prize money and creating over 100 esports events yearly. The ESL platform is the first destination for gamers of all classes, all skill levels, looking for social, connected, organized gaming services, including trust systems, premium accounts, and behind the scenes, ESL Wire, budgeted at over a million dollars. This ensures fair play by incorporating the industry-leading anti-cheat solution. Versus represents your first step into esports quick and addictive matchmaking. Cups and tournaments give a taste of organized competition taking place in a single day. The pinnacle in this is the Go4 Cup Series, loved by the pros and newcomers alike. The ESL leagues are for the truly dedicated gamers looking for the biggest prizes and glory. The league culminates with the Intel Extreme Masters, the ultimate competition Hundreds of thousands of dollars are at stake on the global events on only the biggest stages, simply the best gamers in the world. ESL is now taking its platform to the next level. Direct access into game APIs. Integrating Versus and anti-cheat technology directly into the user's gamer experience. Team with developers like EA Dice and Riot Games, ESL technology works wonders. ESL TV broadcasts all major matches and events of the Electronic Sports League around the world for millions from over 180 countries. ESL TV's exclusive distribution partner, Twitch TV, the world's largest streaming portal for premium games content, provides live streams on any device, including mobile and smart TVs, enabling hundreds of thousands of concurrent viewers. The typical ESL TV viewer is captive for over 25 minutes, returning for multiple weekly sessions and all in HD. All this makes the ESL ecosystem the platform that matters to interact with the gaming audience, the 
advertising, video creation, event streaming, hands-on experience, branded entertainment, and social network spanning millions. But in the end, it's all about sports. Incredible achievements, fascinating characters, unbelievable skills, and moments no one will ever forget. Bear with me slowly here as I bring us back. Let's go. Perfect. So that was a lot of video there, and I appreciate you guys wanted to sit through, but hopefully it wasn't too boring and the visuals kind of made it a little bit interesting. And if you guys have questions during this, at any point, Sean is right there, so just raise your hand. We don't need to wait till the end just because we're going to be dealing with a lot of details here. Why did I show this video? Again, as I said, Total Entertainment is a company that I work for that created an industry that in itself now has gone from being a hobby industry in kind of the, let's say, the bedrooms and the basements of, uh, of video game fans to being something that's a legitimate sport that now has actually a global stage. Why does that, why does that work at the moment and why is that important in publishing? Because that process of turning a game from just being that one-stop shop that I spoke about before, just a one hit, push it out there, games on your computer and after that you can create your own community if it's super into it but other than that the game's pretty much dead we now have this process where something lasts for a lot longer a good example is starcraft starcraft's a game that's 10 years old still heavily played recently starcraft 2 came out they're expecting the same kind of thing or a game like world of warcraft with its massive community becomes a game which is more of a service rather than a one-stop shop of pushing something out there that entire process, that entire ecosystem that comes out of that is a next level of marketing in terms of how games are pushed out. Because for any person that produces a game, developer, publisher, speaking to the audience, they want their game to be important to the audience for the longest possible time for the simple reason that that's going to increase their revenue, which ultimately we don't work for UNICEF, that's what we're trying to do. So looking at this, the key interests of young people. Beautiful slides here, great. We've got sports, gaming, entertainment. Well, that's ultimately what the three pillars that we're trying to create with eSports are. And that's the three pillars that ultimately were missing to a certain point. Obviously, gaming was there, but missing in that classical approach to how do you push a game out there because you didn't have that platform. By creating a sports event out of gaming in eSports, you give a chance to have casters, have celebrities, have players, have, um, let's say, vocal fans. All these places now have a new area, a new um, spectrum for them to go out, speak, show their appreciation, show their support of their games, which ultimately means that the game will have more of a community to it, which then comes back to that first point. We're no longer talking at the audience, just saying, right, this game's going to be brilliant, it's in a magazine, you open to page, whatever, and there's an advertisement there of a guy with a sword saying, play this game or die. And you say, oh, I'll buy the game. When you get home, the game's terrible. But it's too late, you've already spent the money. That, that can't happen anymore. Now, you'd have an entire cycle of somebody preloading that game, preloading the information, telling you what's gonna come. You might have a celebrity who's saying, I'm gonna play this game, therefore, they're endorsing that product. You might have, let's say, a famous caster that says, hey, I'm gonna be talking about this game once a week for the next six weeks of my life. And you'll get into it because you follow that caster the same way they're a celebrity. So what's really happened in eSports? Looking at the element of spectacle, so obviously creating something that is an actual standout moment that people can take themselves and say, right, I'm gonna go and move to this point to be able to watch, to be engaged, to take part, to show my appreciation. The same way that somebody would say, hey, I'm gonna put on my Arsenal shirt and go to the Emirates Stadium here and cheer for Arsenal. You would have somebody who'd say, hey, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna watch this particular moment in time because this means something to me. This is a standout moment in, in, my, in my sporting, in my esports industry. Coverage. 
there's only value to us putting something out there if people can be involved, can actually listen, can actually take part, can actually speak back. How did that step from the Coca-Cola of the 80s to now happen? It happened because of social media. And the same is true in gaming. With the rise of social media, the rise of involvement, that's where you see the numbers. And at the end of the day, and we'll get to that in a second, the more numbers, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, the more interest, which will ultimately mean the more money that comes in. And wherever there's money, that means that a publisher, a partner, they're interested because, as I said, they're trying to push a product. And the likes of Intel, the likes of Alienware, the likes of uh, Adidas, they support gaming in its esports roots because they know by doing that, they can tap into an audience that before they couldn't speak to. I've got a lovely video which I'll show you in a second about that. Up here I've put sports bars. Do I expect that everybody's running out to watch League of Legends, good shirt sir, uh, a League of Legends event tonight in a sports bar? No. But the fact that that takes place and it's now become a normal event rather than a one-off event shows that that entire system that we were talking about is actually changing because you have a platform that didn't exist before to speak to an audience about your game. Now, League of Legends is, an, is a phenomenal success story. I mean, 300, 300 million players, whatever it is, these guys are doing crazy numbers. But it's the fact that this can actually happen and that there's an appetite for it, an appetite to watch it, an appetite to take part in it, and an appetite to hear and learn about the game. And those are all steps that in that classical publishing role didn't take place because ultimately, what would you do? You'd maybe watch a review if there was one up on YouTube. You'd probably flick through a magazine at your news agents to see what did they give it, an eight out of 10, a seven out of 10, to maybe get some sort of purchase. These are the ends. If you think about Reddit now, let's say Twitter, the speed at which the good is proven to be good and the bad is proven to be terrible is such a quick cycle. That doesn't mean that that classic publishing doesn't have a place anymore. They'll always be the person who's just happy to buy a game based on seeing 16 commercials on MTV. That person belongs in the same way. I'll always get hungry for McDonald's whenever I see the Golden Arches. Even though I know it's not good for me, even though I know that it's stupid, I'll still get hungry for it. That's, that's fine, there's no, there's no mistake in that. But that process of what we're creating changes the playing field. And the really important part is champions. Now, what this does is this actually, again, legitimizes what you're doing because you have a person who's standing out and saying, I am the best, I am crowned in this moment, and that person's, let's say, their, their rise to power takes, let's say, your game with it. And as that game begins to, begins to create, uh, let's say, obtain critical mass, so does that person. Now, that person becomes important for so many reasons. That person's important because you can support them, but that person's also important because you can believe them. And now you've changed something into two new directions because this is somebody who can then endorse an upcoming game. So you've created a whole new level of person to go out there and say, this game's brilliant, you should play this, you shouldn't play this. This person now has a voice that can influence others. They're an influencer. But at the same time, that person has given a whole new level to where the game sits at, because you say, this person is the greatest StarCraft player of all time. Who is the greatest StarCraft player of all time? Why is this person the greatest? There becomes a story about that. And in eSports, I could take three people now, and we could all take controllers, and we could play each other at Mario Kart, right here on the stage. But let's say I won, or let's say I lost. Do you guys really think you'd care? Of course not, because it took all of five or 10 minutes to crown that champion. There was no story to it. If you think about the Intel Extreme Masters, which I'm gonna show you a video actually next, and what that is in an entire season, it's now in its seventh season, that's 270 days of gaming. That's more than the Formula One season is, and I mean, that's a long season. What does that mean? That means if you're watching it from day one all the way to the end, not only will the guys who win it most likely tear up, but your investment in it has been huge. So the games that we see in, for example, the Intel Extreme Masters are only the most popular games. League of Legends, StarCraft, Counter-Strike was in up until uh, two seasons ago. And that's purely because their critical mass as a game is so phenomenal. 
Now that doesn't mean that all the other games that are out there, whether it's Call of Duty, whether it's a, a Battlefield, FIFA, that they don't want to be in the Intel Extreme Masters. Of course they would like to be, but it only makes sense to be in that top echelon that we saw in the movie before, the, the top echelon of gaming, when you have that real number for the simple reason that those are products that are supported not by a publisher directly, so it's not the publisher's money who's pushing that, there's a partner, Intel in this case, and Intel is looking to tap into an audience member. So that's what they're kind of doing. Let's have a look at another one of these videos right here. Um, quick touch on the games. As I mentioned before, League of Legends, massive MOBA, massively online battle arena game. Dota 2, again, another MOBA, huge, huge following numbers. StarCraft, maybe the mother of all of the, let's say, the, the online strategy games. Super competitive, massive copies sold. And then we go to the first person side, games that you recognize here. I mentioned before, Counter-Strike, Call of Duty, obviously ramp, ramping up with their ghost title at the moment, and World of Tanks, a game that has done phenomenal numbers in how it reaches out to people and what does it actually present in terms of creating a social experience. Again, the games changed the way that they spoke to the audience from being a one-time shot of buy-in or don't to actually becoming something where people said, hey, I'm getting involved in this game because the game almost becomes a subscription. It becomes something that you buy into. It becomes the same as your um, desire to watch Lost or um, Friends or whatever program you enjoy watching on a daily, weekly basis, that becomes your hobby, it becomes something that comes in. These games are all vying to become that same, let's say, gaming as a service solution. And what makes sense to that is them having a story that keeps you coming in. Because you can only play so many hours a day, but you can consume information on the go, standing at the bus stop, at your desk at work, in between uh, a break, uh, after lunch, get on. What's the information? What was played last night? Who played last night? Who's ranking number one in the UK? When is the next European championship? When is the next global championship? All these elements give you more ways to be involved in that process of, of them publishing a game and in increasing your interest. Any questions on that? No. Super. Here I highlight some of the upcoming games. Reason I point this out is the success that we've seen in the last 10 years, which again is a very, very, very short, short span of any industry, has led to a lot of eyeballs being cast onto this industry. What does that mean? That means that there are more players that want to come in and get involved, which is awesome. It means it's growing and there's more than enough appetite for those games. Uh, a common misconception is people see somebody playing, for example, and I'll use the League of Legends uh, example once again, I see you keep seeing your t-shirt. Um, so you play League of Legends. That doesn't mean that's the only game you play. The same way I watch, um, let's say, the last, last show. That doesn't mean that's the only show that I'm watching. I might also say, hey, I'm happy to watch uh, Suits. Whatever other game, Boardwalk Empire, the same is true in gaming. So the people that you're speaking to have such an appetite for what you're putting out there that we haven't reached a point yet where there's saturation, where you say there's too much. There is definitely an element of too many champions because, it, as I mentioned before, you can't keep crowning people every five minutes because if you crown the, league, the StarCraft champion and you crown the StarCraft champion, which one is actually the more important? Of course, you let them play each other. That's the lovely part of, of, of esports but it doesn't make it easy. What made, let's say, the success and the critical mass of this as a publishing platform make sense? And that is simply looking at the numbers. Now, all the way over there, we see in 2010, so we're now talking back a couple of years, Gamescom was reaching, in terms of real viewers, over a, um, a stream platform, 35,000. That's not, that's, it's not really that great. But if we then jump over to right over here in 2013, same, same uh, uh, program, Intel Extreme Masters at Gamescom, the numbers speak for themselves. Now that means that there's an appetite there for people 
to watch that. And as that grows quickly and exponentially now, you can see it starts to take on what would have been legitimate formats, also battling for their own right. And I look at right above me the Winter X Games, same story. A lot of people wouldn't say gaming is similar to skateboarding, but it really has a lot of the same elements. They're both industries that have had to really fight for their presence and their awareness. Because for a lot of mainstream industries, like for example, the movie industry, it's always seen as a tertiary kind of, hey, that's something we tag on, we're doing a campaign of a movie, Spider-Man, oh, we'll pump out a Spider-Man game at the same time, rather than the game being the forefront. And we're seeing a switch now, that the games really have their own legitimacy, and you can see the games are actually pulling the cart, and there's actually movies, some of them not very good, most of them not very good, being made around the games. And that really shows that change of how there's a demand and an appetite for those products. Of course, US and uh, MLS also up there to go there. I'm gonna show you guys this video now about what basically the Intel Extreme Masters is in season seven, and afterwards we can jump on some questions if there are any. Their audio Evening tour. Let's take a look at what we've done in season seven. In many ways, it was a groundbreaking season. A season where our streaming results continued to impress. A season where our social media reach went through the roof. A season where the Intel Extreme Masters filled a sports stadium. Intel Extreme Masters goes to six events with a total of one million visitors. Those visitors get a chance to interact with the newest technology at the Intel Experience Showcase. They also get to enjoy watching the world's best gamers compete in a tournament series with $700,000 in prizes. Tournaments get streamed to the internet, embedded on dozens of websites and viewed live by millions of people. Experiencing it live engages people to share their enjoyment with others on social media. The reach of the events adds up to tens of millions. The season started at Gamescom in Germany. It was an epic opening where we had more than 275,000 tuned in, breaking our previous record for concurrent viewers. We then went to Cytex in Singapore, where we achieved a 132% increase in streaming sessions compared to the Intel Extreme Masters Taipei held in 2010. Germany was our next location for the massively successful ESL Studio event, bringing in record numbers once more. To open 2013, we went to Katowice in Poland. Held as a standalone event, the show filled an entire sports stadium. More than 318,000 people tuned in, setting a new record for the series. Over three days of the event, streaming sessions nearly equaled all of season five put together. In February, the tour hit Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the broadcast sessions went up by 97% compared to season six. The 2013 Intel Extreme Masters World Championship had a staggering impact in social media. Day one alone beat the previous year's entire World Championship statistics in terms of reach and impressions. This was Intel Extreme Masters Season 7. This video still doesn't provide an answer as to why the Intel Extreme Masters works. So we've prepared this. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, where are we now? So, 
what we saw there is kind of basically what does the numbers mean? How do we reach a large audience? How do we go about turning what was a very one-dimensional static conversation and creating something that really lives and breathes? Now we looked there at the Intel Extreme Masters Season 7, which is a big deal and there's a lot of, let's say, hype around it because it is a truly global competition. And um, I, I don't want to, let's say, bore you guys too much with videos, but I'd love to show you a video which explains how we share that kind of Trojan horse approach with Intel. And the idea in that being is that in all of video games throughout kind of the history of them being out, there's been a, a process whereby um, the industry of video games is one of the only ones that's almost self-regulated because I could go right now to most journalists and say, hey, I'm not going to pay you directly because that would be paying for reviews, but I could surely take you on a very nice trip to XYZ location, you get to review the game, you get to see it in its best light, and in return for that, we'll get a story in your magazine, some cover out. So that kind of honest journalis journalis journalism is a little bit out the window. And that's true in every industry. I know that you could take somebody who writes about cars and let them have a wonderful experience with a car and they do the same. But in gaming, it can sometimes be quite dangerous because you don't actually let somebody um, hear about a product in an honest kind of way. What changes now is if we look at kind of the, the reach of what works with esports, you now only need to really put out a story at one level, which is your event, your time to shine, your time to show what your game actually does. And simply through that, you're reaching the people that are there. So you saw in the pictures there on the video, imagine this being full. I show you why this game is fun to play. An audience says, I like that. Now, of course, that audience is there physically in the studio, creating the ambiance, helping to make whatever happens more of a spectacle, as we saw before, really showing. Then you have casters that are sitting there to actually highlight why does this make sense. But then, of course, you go out to what we're going to be streaming. Just like streaming today, you'll have an audience that's hitting out beyond that, able to share, able to say, I'm watching this. Why does this make me happy? Why should it perhaps make my friends happy? Why should I be telling them about it? Why should I get them involved in it? And then, of course, that's the social element. You're taking what you've actually shown, what you've made, what you've created, and letting people basically vote for you by them supporting, liking, and pushing out whatever you're doing. This entire process, this entire snowball effect, is something that's much more honest than the classic approach to just saying, I'm going to tell you why you should get involved with this game and why you should uh, pay attention and why you should listen. It actually becomes an ongoing ecosystem, which again, fits well to that gaming as a service, as we spoke about before. That simple idea that I don't want your money as a publisher day one. I don't want you to just come in, buy the game and leave. What I really want you to do is ideally buy the game and then start paying subscriptions every month to continue playing. That model is much more attractive. People say, okay, well, how does that fit with free-to-play? Because there are so many free-to-play games now. That's even more honest. They're saying, trust me, I'm so confident my game is good, you don't even need to pay me that first bit of money. Just get in and start playing and I'm sure that as you're playing the game, you'll feel confident that you now want to give me your money to say thank you for giving me such a great gaming experience. It's a much more honest approach. It has much higher risks, obviously, because if the game is bad, you're done. It'd be like saying, go into the movie theater, watch the first 10 minutes of the next Spider-Man movie, James Bond movie, whatever, and if you don't like it, you can get up after the first 10 minutes. You don't, have to even, you don't even have to pay, but if you do, Put some money in on the way out. Is it sustainable? For hell yeah. It's sustainable as long as your game is good. And that's that difference in that publishing. In the classic situation, the publisher was just putting hype out there, saying buy the game, take it home, the, the back of the box screenshots looked amazing, explosions, there was a cool dude on the front with two guns, everything looked brilliant. When you got it home, you opened it, this is a piece of it's too late. You spent that money. 
you might never spend again with that publisher, with that developer, but your experience was over. But they didn't care because they were already looking for the next game. Now it becomes an ecosystem. As you see right behind, that same story is true. And eSports is really that platform where you can push that. Meet the gaming enthusiast. He is 18 to 34 years old. He loves technology. He is social. He is constantly connected. He wants the latest high-end gadget, phone, tablet, TV, laptop, computer processor. He is willing to spend money on it. He influences the tech choice of his friends and family. At the same time, he doesn't watch television. He plays video games. He downloads videos on demand. He defines his own entertainment and he blocks ads when he is online. He is smart enough to protect himself from the likes of you. In most cases, he is the one that chooses to reach out to you. This is where the Intel Extreme Masters comes in. The Intel Extreme Masters is the sports league of the digital era. It combines a series of gaming events in Europe, Asia, South and North America into a prestigious and lucrative tournament circuit for professional gamers that ends with a world championship event. Every time the Intel Extreme Masters visits a city, it is an interactive festival where thousands of enthusiasts get a chance to have hands-on experience with the latest gaming technology at the Intel Experience Showcase. At the same time, an Intel Extreme Masters event gathers the world's best gamers from all corners of the globe to compete in the tournament for cash prizes. Enthusiasts at the event, as well as millions of them in over 180 countries around the world, get to watch every bit of an amazing spectacle. The Intel Extreme Masters is not advertising. It is authentic. It is genuine. It is the enthusiast entertainment. Arsenal has got a triple kill. They are going to use the absolute zero. Everything is going to go down. Beautiful. This is insane because SK Gaming are just ripping the Nexus apart. Pete has been dropped as well. Oh my God, Arsenal does it again and again. The Intel Extreme Masters lets you engage with an enthusiast on an emotional level. Get him to love you and have him do your work for you. Did that make sense? Is that kind of logical of what I'm saying? So you've basically gone from a story where you're basically putting out a game and just trying to push it out, actually Trojan horsing it to an extent, because you're taking now your product, in this case Intel, and you're letting that community, that society, that actually build and push forward what you're trying to work with. How does that work for a company like Intel? Now this is a, an enjoyable return on investment wheel, so we'll get into a little bit of the kind of the, the nitty gritty of how people are really going about getting back what they put into, into something like eSports. Now, we start at the top with content. That's very simple. We live, die, stand purely by one element, and that is audience. The minute there's no audience actually taking part, watching, sharing, liking what we're creating, we're already dead in the water, so to speak. Because for that to be successful, you need to have people that are actually taking what you're doing and to an extent doing the dirty work for you. Now, I don't mean dirty work that they're, let's say, doing it badly, but they're basically sharing it. And in each one of these, we see first the athletes. First element is, if you're liking, if you follow somebody, the same way if I follow Juan Mata from Chelsea, when he says something, there's a chance I'm going to share that story. The same is true in esports, which creates a spillover into friends, which actually will then take people that before perhaps weren't even aware that a game existed. They've now been told about it by a credible source. And that credible source can be a friend, can be uh, somebody they work with, 
that person is what we call an influencer and their strength is what you're actually looking to tap into in terms of that modern publishing. We then take whatever the element is and we're broadcasting it, putting it out just like now, live to as many people as possible in their homes. That's the soap opera element. If we look back at the classic WWF or WWE stories, it was fake, but people tuned in because there was a show story. There was, you know, Randy Savage or The Undertaker or whoever it was, was doing their business every week, week in, week out, and you were tuning in to see what happens. In these competitions, the same is true. You have celebrities, characters, people that create actual interest, and their story is what will drive other people to take part, to listen, and to believe. Whatever they're doing, needs to be put out there, seeding that information. And as we saw before with the kind of the touch wheel of how that grows out, that seeding, that sharing of the story is again doing that story for your game and for how you're actually gonna put it out there and get the marketing around. But it's sustainable in the sense that this happens every day. And once the community is actually taking part in it, then the community will do a lot of the work for you, which leads to then the press seeing that there's interest. Very simply, why does, why does a newspaper in the UK, the sun, why does it never say, everything's fine, it's lovely weather, we're all happy? Because nobody wants to read that. People are looking for a sensation, they're looking for stories, they're looking for something that they want to get involved with. So the same is true for this. We're creating emotional stories. Underdog team gets knocked out, new team does well, team that used to play in Counter-Strike but is now playing in Firefall, doing phenomenally well, better than being expected. These are these emotional stories that take that game and give that game a place and an audience for different people to look at. And at the same time, create more awareness around that game. It's that community for that game that really creates build-up. Now, the next point up here is player retention. I spoke about it before, about how a game like StarCraft can enjoy 10 years of being the number one PC title. 10 years, that's crazy. When you think about it, it's an industry that is normally fueled by technological advances. The step from Xbox and PlayStation 2 to 360 and PlayStation 3 was a step to HD, which everybody saw, it looked amazing, more pixels on your screen, everything looked better. The next step won't be as abrupt because of course we've already reached high definition it'll be more in the back end where you'll see power but there's still a same story there you're driving the uh, the awareness driving the fact that people are going to be staying in playing something the game cycle is the exact same way there's a hundred million people hundred million copies of the Call of Duty franchise out there if those people are playing that game I can tell you right now that Activision, just like any other publisher, they want to make sure that you continue playing that game. Coming back to that subscription idea, they'd love to know that the next time they put something out there, whether it be a map pack, a new game, you name it, that that 100 million, or at least a significant chunk, is so happy and so invested in that game, that community, that they'll go to that next level, which is purchasing it. Ultimately, creating that subscription model. Exposure to non-players, very simple. Understand how that works. As things become more powerful and get more awareness, people will care. If I sit around again, right here with you, sir, playing Mario Kart, there's no chance that anybody in the world is gonna come and ask us how, how that felt. If we play that same game, but we fill up this entire bank of seats, I'm pretty sure people would be interested, how do we get to that point? Why were the people watching there? You create that story. And that's come from a very simple source that's quite easy because it's already the existing game. You're just creating more spectacle out of it. And if we go back to that slide of the actual spectacles, that's what we're doing now, creating that moment. I put up a picture here, which is our um, stage at the Gamescom. Looks lovely. Underneath I wrote Katowice. Also an amazing, amazing event in Poland. Now, working in esports is kind of a weird one because in all honesty, um, 
it's like almost reinventing the wheel. There's no, there's no set path for where things are going to be. Ten years ago, it didn't exist. Five years ago, it looked terrible. And now it's at an actual credible point where, as I said before, large investors, serious money is being put into it. Why are they putting their money into it? For that same reason. This is a new form of publishing that gives you three elements. Credible story, because it came from somebody you trust. It gives the longevity of the title, because the title isn't just one moment, it actually lives on. And finally, it gives that chance to really have a community around, which will help those other two. So basically, you're creating pillars of success for putting a game out, that there actually is a reason for people to get involved. Now, I'm not saying that every game will have to do that, but you can already see, I play Plants vs. Zombies. I've just come back from PAX, landed yesterday, Seattle, great show. The amount of people that I met there who I would have considered to be more hardcore in their gaming, but absolutely are in love with Plants vs. Zombies. Each game, whether it be Tiddlywinks, has the potential to have people sharing their experiences and talking about why they love it and why they're emotionally attached to it. What we're doing within eSports is giving them a platform for them to meet each other, to share about their common interests, to share about the excitement of playing that game, and to see and take part in professional elements around that game. That's truly what eSports is. I have one last video that I'm going to show you guys. This one always makes me cry. Hope it doesn't make you cry, it would be weird. But after that, we'll do some questions. This one's really easy because it's just, just musical. Not my music, I didn't make the music. This isn't mine, this is just a, a trailer, which we can skip. Unless you guys wanted to watch that. You guys want to see all of this or you want to do some questions? I, I'm happy to watch this, but it's up to you. No response? Watch it.
So that was nice. You may ask, why do I show that video? For the simple reason, I really, really, really like it. If I like it, I mean, I think it does a really good job of telling the story that I'm trying to explain throughout all of this. And that is simply that there was nothing and we created something that is different. Not me personally, not you personally, but all together in that same way that there becomes a legitimate voice that actually has a story that people care about and people want to follow and get involved with. I show this video because for a lot of people that have no idea about what esports is, it's such a crazy idea and it's so far flung from, from any kind of normality that they don't, it's hard to fathom it. Perfect example, my sister, 37 years old. She loves playing Professor Layton on her DS. She's totally into that. When I try to explain to her that I go to events all over the world where we get 100,000 kids sitting in an audience watching something, watched by another 50,000 on a live stream in six different uh, languages totaling another half a million with money upwards of 100, 200, 300,000 dollars to be won as prizes. It becomes quite difficult or quite unfathomable and hopefully by seeing this, if you haven't already seen it, you get a bit of an idea. And that element is in itself the step to publishing a game in a new way, creating that element that it's sustainable, there's an ecosystem, that return on investment that we saw before actually makes sense by using this channel. As we saw with Intel, they use this because it gives them credibility and the way to get people that are actually the vocal Trojan horses of their products to actually be involved and take part in it. And that's the next level of publishing. Yay, let's ask some questions. You good, sir. Um, given that Counter-Strike came about from an active mod community from the original Half-Life, uh, how important do you think that mod communities are in the future of gaming? Um, absolutely massive. Uh, if you look at games like EverQuest Next with uh, their new, what is it, EverQuest, I forget the name of the, the title, but it's a whole separate expansion of EverQuest Next that they're purely making based on the element that there will be people wanting to create their own envisaging of, of, of what that game's going to look like. So you'll have that point. Game cycle will take you from day one to maybe day 50, 50 hours in, however you want to see it. And then at that point, there becomes an, an endless, almost bigger game, almost, I wouldn't say meta, but there's a massive game out there for whatever you create. Um, EverQuest is doing it. Um, Neverwinter is doing it with the Foundry. I think they already have something like, the game's only three weeks old, and it already has uh, 30, 30,000, or maybe even 300,000, but, don't quote me on that, but either, either way, it was a three and a bunch of zeros at the end, uh, and it wasn't three million. Um, different elements have been created in the foundry, which are basically just people creating their own missions, their own stories. So I think what you'll see is modding and as it's, let's say, most classical in, let's say, Dota, you know, if somebody just modding the, the, the Warcraft engine or um, uh, Counter-Strike, that will remain but I think that you'll see publishers that will almost dumb down the ability of modding to make it even more accessible because that, again, creates more longevity. It's something that isn't often difficult to do. It's just offering the tools of the development to your audience. But if that can keep people coming in for even a day longer, a week longer, and creating more stories, then it's something that they're going to support, or at least I would imagine they should support. Hi, Sean. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Tommaso Thank from you. Campus Party. Uh, <laughs> Intel Extreme Master Sao Paulo was yeah. at Campus Party. Yes, enough. it was indeed. Just to say this. Uh, um, for Campus Eros, uh, the gaming industry is really, really relevant. Mm, yeah. uh, it's an industry that uh, we consider fundamental for innovation, for yeah. developing passion, etc. So my question is, 
when this is going to be broadcasted live by TVs, so where the big money is going to come in and well, then the money goes to the programmers, to the developers, to the Camposero that makes video games? So it's, it's a, a, a brilliant question and um, I can only give you so much my personal view of how it works. Mainstream television, to an extent, has, doesn't have the, the, the credibility at least to me, and again, this is purely my opinion, it's not the opinion of any of the people that I've been talking about or even Turtle Entertainment, it doesn't have the same place in society that it had perhaps even five years ago for the simple reason that the speed at which I can now choose the content and how I watch it, even, even on my sky box, I can choose when I watch something, how I watch something, changes that classic kind of, I turn on and they tell me when to watch. And I go, okay, tonight it's The Simpsons at 6.30. I can now go over to Hulu, which I don't know if you guys have Hulu, but Netflix, whatever it is, and choose I'm going to watch my content the way I want. And they put that for me in every way possible. I can have that Netflix on my iPhone, iPad, my 360. All these different ways are basically helping me consume the way I want to consume, which in essence goes back to that idea about Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola used to tell you what you should feel when you're drinking Coca-Cola. They, they put the idea in there. Now, with the names on the side of the, they want you to share their story and show how you're involved with Coca-Cola. That same is true of the way that people will watch eSports. It makes more sense that people watch it in their process, which would be realistically watching it via Twitch as the largest, uh, let's say, streaming uh, 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 provider of, of eSports rather than going and trying to legitimize and say, hey, how can we get this on BBC One, for example? And I think that comes a little bit to do with the age demographic of how people are watching. Um, I think tennis fits more to what the average, let's say, uh, BBC audience is probably looking for, and streaming fits much more to a, yeah, I'd say a younger uh, um, uh, audience. And I think you'll see much more focus on that. And I agree, it would be amazing to get it into that um, into, that, into that business model if it was only simply for the ad revenue money that comes out of it. But I think more important is increasing the numbers on streaming, which we're seeing now. Every event has growth. The international, the championship series, whatever event is each time getting more and more. So there's critical mass growing. I think when it hits a stagnation point and we say, we can't get more than a million people watching something live. Then we might say, okay, what's, what's the next channel we need to, need to uh, exploit to, to be able to reach more people and increase that viewing numbers? But as long as the channels which we're using are growing, I think there's, there's a, a story to focusing on, on that because those channels also really look to support us. Does that answer a little bit or? We haven't got any more time for any more questions, sorry. Oh, well, Thank I'll you. be right here if anybody wants to just come and just ask me questions just straight up.